Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Building Back American Manufacturing in El Paso Luncheon. Please welcome to the stage Advisory Board Chair for the Aspen Institute Latinos and Society Program, Ambassador Gadi Vasquez. Good afternoon, everyone, and I trust that you're enjoying good company, a great lunch, and we are delighted that you are here. And I stand before you on behalf of uh, not only myself, but my fellow board members who serve on the advisory board, uh, two of whom are with us today and others who are here in spirit and cheering us on uh, during this convening. But you know, it's always exciting when we're able to come together like this and be able to share our experiences, our journeys, uh, and the learning opportunities that we have had as an emerging community uh, in our nation, in our respective states, in our respective communities. And it's great to be with leaders, to be with influencers, with catalysts, innovators. Uh, pero más que todo, de estar unidos como familia. As we, we dream about the future, as we begin to shape what America will look like in the years and decades and generations to come. And so I hope that you take every moment, every opportunity to derive the benefits of this summit as I witnessed during the breakout sessions as there were standing room only sessions in a number of the breakouts. And so I encourage you to continue uh, to be engaged throughout the course of the day. I do want to take a moment though to acknowledge the presence of the Secretary of State from Rhode Island, the Honorable Nelly Gorbea. Nelly, where are you, Secretary of State? <laughs> Delighted to have you with us today. And also delighted to have with us Melody Gonzalez, who's the director of the White House Hispanic Initiatives Program. Where are you, Melody? Please stand and be recognized. So we're delighted that you're with us, and we're delighted that uh, we've been able to come together for this lunch. And, uh, and I hope that, as I mentioned, that you enjoyed the breakout sessions. Uh, we have a special lunch presentation in recognition of El Paso's recent win of the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. Say that five times. Uh. <laughs> By showcasing El Paso's success, we are collectively changing the narrative of El Paso by highlighting its potential as a metro area border economy positioned to return jobs back to America and to forge a path forward to advance and manufacturing and strengthen the pipeline of talent of our country. In addition, El Paso's victory is a model for cities across the country on what can be achieved when collaboration and collective vision is organized. Congresswoman Veronica Escobar was instrumental in supporting the El Paso Build Back Better Challenge application. She saw the potential of this project to build American advanced manufacturing and to bring prosperity to the region. Congresswoman Escobar represents Texas 16th Congressional District. She serves on the House Judiciary Committee, the House Ethics Committee, and the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. In addition, she serves as Vice Chair of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Military Personnel. Before her election, she served on the governing body for El Paso County first as a county commissioner and then as a county judge. The congresswoman will frame today's discussion and the genesis of the grant. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Escobar, who is speaking and joining us and jo speaking to us live from El Paso, Texas. Congresswoman, welcome. Hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all today. I wish I could be there with you, sitting and um, enjoying everybody's company, uh, having lunch with you, and participating in this panel in person. Um, but I am coming to you from the beautiful, uh, fantastic community of El Paso, Texas. Um, and I am so grateful to the Aspen Institute and for everyone who is participating uh, um, in this luncheon and in this conversation. So yes, El Paso was the only city in Texas to uh, be awarded the Build Back Better grant. Um, and I first want to say that the Build Back Better grant would not have been possible were it not for President Biden and his administration. 
which wanted to not just build back better after COVID, but saw the incredible need for equity in rebuilding communities like El Paso. Um, I also want to thank um, my incredible amiga and a fabulous leader who um, I was honored to host in El Paso yesterday, Assistant Secretary uh, Alejandra Castillo, who I know will be there with you all and who has played a, a really powerful role at the EDA and within commerce. I'm so grateful for her leadership. And you're gonna hear from wonderful people talking about the grant and what it means. But I, I want to offer you this perspective and this context as you begin this great conversation. Many of you are familiar with El Paso, some of you are not, but we are a community that is about 85% Latino and that has been historically disadvantaged. And we have dealt with chronic poverty. And in some ways it's been um, very, very difficult to break out of that poverty and to create a path to prosperity for all of our families, all of our paseños here on La Frontera. And, and part of those obstacles have to do with state government that limits our access to uh, healthcare. We know access to healthcare is an important avenue to achieving the middle class and, and achieving a path to prosperity. And in Texas, um, we are consistently blocked from gaining that access. We, are, we also live in a state where um, your zip code basically determines the kind of public school funding that you will receive and that your child will receive. So a student in El Paso gets very different public school funding than a child in a wealthy suburb of Dallas or Houston or Austin, et cetera. So there are inequalities built into and baked into the system that El Pasoans have had to try to overcome. But there's another um, challenge that we have faced that the Build Back Better grant is going to help us overcome. And that is that, that our kids, once they've gone through grade K through 12 uh, public education, despite the odds, who have then gone on to our great public university, UTEP, despite the odds, who go into the STEM arena um, and are successful in it despite the odds, after all of this investment that we've made in these young people, outside companies rightfully come in and swoop away our talent and move them to other communities. So despite all of this investment that we're making in brilliant young minds in El Paso, we have been unable to keep much of our talent because of lack of opportunity here. Well, many, many years ago, uh, you're gonna hear from Dr. Asan Chaduri uh, from UTEP. He and I worked on um, access to, when I was El Paso County judge, access to our airport so that his kids, his students could have access to the airspace they needed for their experiment. And there began a great conversation and journey about keeping that talent in El Paso. What we needed was someone to invest in helping our manufacturers pivot away from the manufacturing they were doing to focus on additive manufacturing and defense manufacturing. That in turn, we believed, would help us keep that brilliance in El Paso because there would be jobs, there would be opportunity, um, there would be a future for those young people in El Paso. And so as we were slowly working on this dream, this vision, lo and behold, the Biden administration and Congress with the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I'm so proud to have voted yes for that law. I've been the only member of Congress from our region to have done so, but the Biden administration, the bipartisan infrastructure law, magic happened. And the Build Back Better grant, as you'll hear um, in the panel, is like a steroid shot in this dream that we have to keep our great talent and brilliance in El Paso, to revitalize our economy, and to give a community like ours the fighting chance that we deserve and that we have earned to build a path to prosperity for everyone, especially this Latino community that has been on the front lines of so much, and we have always been a community that leads with goodwill and with love, and we finally have an administration 
that sees that and is giving us that great opportunity. So again, apologies for not being there with you all. I look forward to future conversations with the Aspen Institute. Um, felicidades for all your work, and I hope you have a robust, wonderful conversation. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Congresswoman Escobar, for being a fearless advocate for our community and a dedicated public servant. Uh, we are taking full advantage of technology during this conference, as you've already uh, experienced to some degree, but we're going to continue with the virtual uh, connection, and it's my privilege uh, and opportunity to introduce uh, Mr. Ty Bland, who's the Head of Government Affairs for the Creative Artists Agency. CAA, as it's better known in the industry, sits at the nexus of talent, content, brands, technology, sports, and live events, and creates limitless opportunities for the storytellers, trendsetters, icons, and thought leaders who shape popular culture. At CAA, Mr. Bland oversees the agency's role in local, state, and federal legislation and regulatory action. He has extensive experience in Capitol Hill and has also served as Chief of Staff in the California State Assembly and as a legislative representative for the city of Los Angeles. Would you please join me in giving a welcome to Ty Bland. Ty? Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm assuming that's a yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm privileged and honored to be able to, uh, to, to serve as the moderator for this panel. Uh, I think the, the needs for infrastructure development, the needs for manufacturing, the need uh, for building our communities back better uh, is, is one that I am proud uh, of the great work that Congresswoman Escobar has done, uh, and equally important, uh, proud of the work that the administration has done. I, I'd like to bring our panelists uh, to, to the stage, and I'll introduce them individually. I would, I would presume that they are going to sort of walk and sit accordingly. Uh, I'm gonna start uh, with Alejandra Castillo. Uh, she is the assist Assistant Secretary of the US EDA, the Economic Development Agency. Will she come forward? I believe she's there. Alejandra, great to see you. Uh, the second is my, my good friend. Uh, we had a chance to meet uh, about a week or so ago, uh, Dr. Absan uh, Cheduri who is the Associate Vice President uh, of Aerospace uh, at UTEP, at UTEP, our great public institution in uh, El Paso. And, and last but not least, um, a living example of somebody who uh, has, has worked through the ranks and built themselves uh, into an incredible professional, uh, Pablo Rodriguez with Prod Design and Analytics. El Paso Business Center. Thank you very much for you all being here. Um, I wanted to make sure that, that we, we sort of set the stage a little bit and, and just talk about where the, the, the depth and the breadth is in this program um, and why it's so critically important. Uh, I think it's important to start with, with the Assistant Secretary and have her tell a little bit about the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, uh, how it worked, and what the goal of the administration was to accomplish. So I'll turn it over uh, to the Assistant Secretary. Madam Assistant Secretary, the floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you, Ty. And, and um, I don't even know, it's good afternoon, right? Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. I'll tell you why. I, I, we got in from El Paso at 3 a.m. Um, this morning, so forgive me if, if I meander a little bit. But this is exciting moment, and let me tell you why. Let's go back two and a half years ago, middle of a pandemic, we figured out, and the country figured out, just how many gaps we had in communities across the country. I'll even tell you, my own community of Corona Queens in New York City was the epicenter. That's where you saw the makeshift morgues. That's where you saw kids that couldn't have access to broadband in the middle of New York City. But that was not just New York City. It happened all across the country. We saw Latinos in parking lots trying to just get a little access, and it put a spotlight on where the gaps in our country were. Along comes President Biden, understanding this, puts together, the, the Congress put together the American Rescue Plan. And it was really an intention of not only helping us get through the pandemic, 
but also, as the Congresswoman said, seed for the future. So EDA, which is one of 13 different bureaus in the Department of Commerce, and those of you who know me, I love commerce because commerce is just incredible. Census, International Trade Administration, uh, National Telecommunication and Information Agency. But EDA was, was at the forefront of receiving $3 billion. And Congress gave us one year. They said, okay, you got $3 billion, but you gotta spend it in one year. And we said, okay, how are we going to do that? Where are we going to focus on? And our, our sweet spot is working with communities that are distressed. So six different grants were put together for this $3 billion, but the two main ones, the two large ones, the ones that are really exciting for the Build Back Better Regional Challenge, a billion dollar challenge across the country, and then the Good Jobs Challenge. I'm gonna focus on the Build Back Better because this is where everyone should be like wearing their, I don't know, Buck Rogers or Jepsons or whatever cap you wanna wear as futurists. A billion dollar challenge and we said, look, Con Washington doesn't know what you need, you tell us. So we s flipped the switch basically. And we told communities across the country, give us your best ideas. We received 529 applications. From there we went to 60, and then we journeyed with them. We gave them uh, technical assistance, half a million dollars. And from that 60, we selected only 21. Not because they weren't all meritorious, but because we didn't have enough money. And it's great to see El Paso. El Paso received $40 million. But I was in Fresno, California. Anyone from California here? <laughs> and if you've been to Fresno, you know what I'm talking about. Latinos, farm workers. This is for tech, tech, uh, agrotech. I've also been to Wichita, Kansas. Anyone here from Kansas? I saw you, Delia. These are places where there's Latinos everywhere, where we are now investing, making critical investments to not just help the industries that have been there and have been not forgotten but unnoticed, where Latino business owners have been there as part of the supply chain. And now we have this opportunity to seed that. Now, $40 million is not what you need, right? You said 1.5 yesterday. But $40 million starts to put a signal out to the marketplace that something magical is happening in El Paso. And that's what we wanna do because we need private sector money, we need philanthropy. So I'm gonna stop there because there's a lot to talk about, but thank you, I appreciate it. A, a great explanation by the Assistant Secretary. We really appreciated the framework uh, for that. L let, let me take a liberty as the moderator just to in indicate that question and answers uh, are gonna be offered at the end of, of this session. So uh, hold your questions. I think there are some cards floating around somewhere. Uh, you can sort of jot down your question uh, and somebody from, from the team will grab them and then we'll, we'll pose them later. L let me turn it over if I can to uh, Dr. Shaduri, who is, um, is the brains and, and, and the infrastructure and the heart behind this this effort. Uh, doctor, can you talk to us a little bit about the winning project, A, and then B, tell us what it took to get it done. Um, thank you so much, Madam Secretary, and thank you for uh, inviting uh, us here. Uh, um, I'm humbled, and uh, it's, it's really a process of transforming a community. If you know about us that uh, back uh, in NASA took out 30,000 jobs from our community. And um, America wants to buy cheaper stuff so that El Paso suffer unemployment. But our community leaders over the decade work on to rebuild our community and they build quality of life, healthcare. We call those initiatives is called El Paso 1.0. And we, we build a massive infrastructure that just to really ensure that, that we don't continue to lose our competitiveness. And then University of Texas El Paso under uh, Dr. Diana Natalicio went to a mode of try to become a research one university. We want to become a research one university with a singular focus, creating access. We become a research one university without ever closing our door. Uh, we are not like other university who select people based on their SAT, GPA. We select people based on their aspiration. We, we believe that higher education is a right. <laughs> so we are the only research one university in the country that has open access. Uh, we believe that's the role of public higher ed, education for common people. 
So we built massive research infrastructure, uh, and along the way we built two major research centers. One of them founded by me is Aerospace Center. Another is founded by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ryan Wicker, is a additive manufacturing research center. We have done hundreds of millions of dollars of research through our research centers, and two kids from El Paso zip code and put them in aerospace and defense workforce. People thought those people cannot be with an engineer, and they are building your know, next generation of weapon platform, aircraft, missile system. Those are the kids from El Paso. Lockheed F-35 program has 482 of my graduates. So, and everyone came from El Paso zip code. So here come Congresswoman Escobar, and I, uh, it's, a, it's a dear friend, and she told, oh, wh what are you doing sending all the people outside? What can we do to keep them? So we, we started journeys together to ensure that can we use the research preeminence? Can you use our research connection to create economic development agenda? It's done differently. I, I'm, I'm a technologist. I'm not an economic development expert. I, you know, my expertise in aerospace engineering, I did supersonic combustion ramjet for my doctoral work, so what do I know about economic development? But one thing I need to know as an El Paso one that we want a fair share of American prosperity. Our community deserves that. You really cannot ignore us and build prosperity in other American city and expect that U.S. aerospace and defense supremacy will stay. So we start working on an economic development plan and we didn't ask money to anyone except EDA. So we started with the I-6 challenge grant uh, just to start conceptualizing this and start connecting people. Then we, then we own a build to scale grant to really put more uh, uh, activities around it. And finally, we own build back better grant. So we have been working on last six years uh, on this and uh, slowly building, building up to that. So it, our coalition is organic, so we have been working together for a long period of time with a common and singular goal to create equitable prosperity uh, for our nation. So that's our goal. This particular project, so one thing is that a America destroyed its small and medium manufacturing supply chains. And we have done that over the last two decades because we keep outsourcing things. What happened now that it created a huge issue for our defense manufacturing. So our project kind of like transcend a national and regional priority together, okay? As we need to build more weapon system or aerospace and defense system, we need more supplier, you know? And why are you gonna get them? Because they don't exist anymore. And people often told me that manufacturing in El Paso, you know, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It's not true. During the whole pandemic, me and my team visited. So we found out El Paso has 300 strong manufacturers. These are small and medium manufacturers. That formed the backbone of our economy. And they didn't ask for, many of them didn't ask for PPE loans. Some of them told me that if I eat, my employee will eat. I'm not gonna lay off any people. I saw the resilience of people that blew me away. I saw that how strong our community is to supporting each other. So we and our aerospace and defense partners, we decided how about we strengthen them? How about we bring 300 small and medium manufacturers out of the shadow and really connect them to aerospace and defense ecosystem. So that's exactly what we are trying to do. But there's a lot of challenges because they don't have the right infrastructure. So in our project, the major buildup is a, our manufacturing district. We call it Advanced Manufacturing District. We're building a purpose-built manufacturing campus, only first in the nation, that will have all infrastructure necessary for a small and medium manufacturer to move in and within two weeks get into production. It will have a common cyber physical infrastructure, it will have a digital overlay. They will have all the digital infrastructure necessary from software to 5G. So that we'll taking away the infrastructure part, part out of our small and medium manufacturer and let them focus on getting to the supply chain. So this is the major part of the project. Thank you, doctor. Incredible, incredible, incredible. You, you, you all heard the congresswoman talk a little bit about despite the odds. You heard the assistant secretary talk about uh, the vision. And, and I think it's also important uh, as we prepare to turn it over to Pablo to talk about the people and the work that they do uh, from the manufacturing standpoint. Uh, when I was on the call with Pablo last week, we talked about it and I was a little, you know, sort of naive. I said, you know, what exactly is the manufacturing process? And talk to me about it. Because the general notion is, is, is a very broad sort of stroke. I love to hear Pablo talk about the innovation, uh, the, the, the fact that he is 
uh, a practitioner. And for him to be able to sort of navigate through this, build his own company, uh, and become uh, a critical part uh, of the El Paso community, I think is so critical. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to, to Pablo and ask him to tell me a little bit about uh, his company uh, and tell us how a project like this uh, might be beneficial or has been beneficial uh, for his company, as well as other manufacturers in West Texas. Pablo? Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very humbled to be here. Thank you for hosting us. Um, it's very interesting to like talk about this process and it's, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective on the, the behind the scenes scenarios. Um, I'm gonna start and just kind of bring it back even further, right? Because we were talking about, I don't know, a couple years or maybe four years ago. I'm gonna go back some uh, 25 years ago and I'm gonna tell you a little story, okay? So just bear with me. And this story is about my personal journey um, I am a first generation American. My parents both are from Mexico. Uh, we moved into El Paso. Uh, I grew up uh, in El Paso and went through the public schools. Uh, and uh, like uh, the congressman said, against the odds, right? So I ended up in a place like MIT. Uh, I got my bachelor's and master's uh, in mechanical engineering there. And when I, when I look to coming back home, right? So we, we also talked about earlier, we talked about familia. When we talk about that, and I wanted to go back home, you know, I, I did my tour on the East Coast and, and it was nice and interesting, but I wanted to go back home. Uh, the, the jobs and the opportunities that were afforded were actually across the border in the Maquila. Uh, these are the opportunities that basically would lead you into your commute would be across an international line. Uh, your daily commute would go through customs, right? And every couple months you would get a, a dog in your car to basically make sure you weren't bringing any contraband or anything. And as an engineer, that's not really what I kind of signed up for, right? <laughs> and I don't think anybody in this room would kind of sign up for something like that. But those are the opportunities that El Paso basically afforded. It was a lot of the maquilas were across the border. Uh, there were, in, in El Paso, there were a lot of logistics. Uh, there's a lot of warehouses that basically bring material back and forth. There's a lot of law enforcement, my respects to all those people. But that's, as an engineer, that's not my, that's not my thrust. So I did leave El Paso and we talk about this brain drain. We talk about having the need to like migrate to other places. Uh, and, and you lose in, in this transaction, you basically lose half of you. You know, there's the professional side and then there's the personal side. There's the family part and then there's the technical side. And you have to kind of like make a choice. Um, I don't think that choice should be, you know, you should have to be making that kind of choice. So, <coughs> I came back to El Paso. I ended up working in big companies across the country. There are a lot of great companies. Uh, but I wanted to go back, especially when you start having your kids and you start having your family and you're like, look, what is in it for my kids and the rest of the balance in my life? Uh, and that's where I came back to El Paso. Uh, we did start a company. It was a startup. It was a garage uh, startup. Uh, anybody that ever had a, a startup uh, understands that there is no glamour in working 20 hours a day, uh, <laughs> seven days a week. There is not a lot of glamour uh, in that. Today, 18, 19 years later, this company employs about 100, 110 people. We do primarily engineering work. Um, thank you. Uh, our focus is actually, we kind of took, okay, the maquilas are there. We're not gonna go and work for the maquilas. So, what are, what are their services and what are the other things that they need? They need equipment, they need manufacturing equipment. So we're not building the widgets, we're building the machines to build the widgets. And in doing that, we're putting the engineering part. Uh, the engineering part gets coupled with the technicians and all the, the tool and die makers and all of the technical people that it really takes a lot of skill sets to basically develop. Uh, that is our company. If anybody ever comes to El Paso, you're welcome to join us. It is a great facility. Yep. Uh, we were there just yesterday. Uh, Madam Secretary experienced it firsthand. It is this great facility. It's over 40, 45,000 square feet. And, and I told uh, uh, the secretary that I said, you know, this building is really a testament of our customers and of the work because there is a lot of work behind these activities, right? We, we kind of like celebrate moments like today, but behind the scenes, there is a lot of work that it takes to get to that point. 
Um, so I know El Paso with this grant uh, is basically starting in that journey. And the idea is that for the next generation of students, that they don't have to take 18, 20 years to get there. That there is not a lot of these efforts that basically like you feel like, look, is there traction? Is there like really, is there a reward at the end of the day? Uh, I really feel that we owe them to that next generation that's like, no, it doesn't need to be that difficult. Excellent, excellent. Well, well thank you so much for that, Pablo. I, I, I tell you, this is really exciting and inspiring for me, and I, I guess there are uh, a couple of other questions. I'm gonna try to figure out how to get these questions read. Give me one second here. I don't know if I can do it. Uh, let's see. Okay, the first question is from the audience. What does the future of Build Back Better 2.0 look like? And I, I would imagine that might be directed to the Assistant Secretary. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a great question because that's what keeps me up at night. Um, I wish as a nation we would understand that economic development is not episodic. It's not just one off. It has to be consistent, almost relentless. And um, the American Rescue Plan gave us a billion dollars for one year. So as we talk to decision makers, particularly across government, um, we have to change our mindset that our nation deserves a build back better three, four, five times over because it could be um, really incredible. Um, but but to Absolutely. answer the question, but to answer the question more specifically, um, it would be a hybrid of Build Back Better and the Good Jobs, because what we noticed in the Build Back Better is that every proposal had a workforce development component to it. Eleven million jobs go unfilled in our country, and we need to not mm -hmm. only educate our, our young people, but we also need to look at the broader generational spectrum of how do we upskill and reskill. Um, so that they can move uh, into these areas. So I will tell you that we are a place-based uh, uh, bureau. Our goal is where do we invest? Um, and it's exciting because you talk about the future. And I usually say this process has given us an opportunity to peek over the horizon. What's coming down the pike? <clears throat> it is aerospace and defense manufacturing, but it's also mass timber, it's also agrotech, it's also hydrogen, it's also so many different areas that as Latinos, it feels like a foreign language. And we have to be part of that. So we not only have to be part of that, but we have to be part of the rules of engagement because they're being put together as we speak. So we need to talk about small businesses and medium-sized businesses, but we also need to talk about what's the future looking like and are we at that table? So um, a lot to a lot to cover. No, all, all great stuff, Madam Assistant Secretary. <laughs> I, I'm going to go off script here a little bit. I know the folks are, are probably going to going to hate me for this, but can I ask each and every one of you individually, the three on the panel, to give one or two? I think the the, the, the Assistant Secretary just did a great job of it, but give us one or two takeaways, one or two things that you think about from a visionary standpoint whether it's with respect to job placement, job creation, economic development, manufacturing, infrastructure build. Give us one or two things that we can think about as city leaders, as community leaders, as business leaders that will take us into, as I like to say, the 22nd century. Just give us a couple of key takeaways, very brief points, but I'd like to do that just so that there's some, some food for thought as we begin to wrap this panel up. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, about that. Um, so, so my first, uh, you know, I just audacious goal, but U.S. must build is advanced manufacturing infrastructure. That is no going back. We must, you know, the same way we're doing the Chief Act and other, but every sector of our manufacturing needs to be rebuilt with a massive capacity, and that investment needs to happen. But I would especially focus on uh, uh, small and medium manufacturers, especially owned by. Uh, minority owners. Uh, so what happened over the last three decades that we diminished our capacity and this small and medium manufacturer uh, couldn't stay in the business because lack of access to innovation, because we don't have any public innovation infrastructure anymore. 
the lack of uh, access to uh, technologies, and uh, simply fact, the lack of access to opportunity. So unless and until we build a massive advanced manufacturing infrastructure in our nation, uh, we compromise our future. So job creation in our country will start from making it. We must make things in our country. We cannot let other country to make everything for us and we consume. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Pablo, your thoughts? So my thoughts are a little bit simpler, okay? So um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we need to bet on ourselves. Uh, I think uh, we all have the potential. Right? Uh, we have the potential, we have the, the know-how, uh, we have to bet and we have to believe in ourselves. Uh, the other half of this is, th so there's like three pieces of it, right? So we have to believe. Uh, number two is uh, these conferences, we have to network. Uh, Dr. Shadori, uh, Veronica Escobar, they approached to me and they basically started forming this coalition, right? I think one of the things that I found about this process, about getting this grant was just how many people, right, from the city representatives, from uh, our, our local, from UTEP. Uh, it is a coalition. It is uh, working as a team. Uh, so that would be the second element. And then the third element, and it's the hard one to kind of swallow, right, because, uh, again, we celebrate it here today, but the, the third element <coughs> is actually the hard work that goes behind it. And when you're in that middle of that, you know, going through that little battle, uh, you do have to keep going. There is, uh, you should set a goal. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and you just have to sometimes just plow through it. So those are the three elements that I would like to kind of focus on. And, and I'm going to build on, on uh, what Pablo said. Um, I really feel that this is the first time in a very long time, and my friend Francisco Sanchez is here. We've journeyed together for three decades. But this is the first time that I feel <clears throat> the U.S. is betting on itself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's exciting. Three takeaways. One is there are four pieces of legislation that President Biden has uh, put into place, uh, has signed into law. The American Rescue Plan, the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the um, Inflation Reduction Act. I know this, is, this sounds like a lot of Washington jargon, but with all of those four pieces of legislation comes massive amount of funding. And it is the first time that the intention and the funding are coupled. The second thing I would say is, you know, take Pablo up for a visit to his, his, uh, his uh, company. It is remarkable. He's doing aerospace, but he's also doing um, medical devices. It's, it's incredible to watch and to witness what technology can do and how we as Latino must embrace it, not with the old narrative, and Ty, you know this very well in terms of storytelling, not the old narrative of it's going to displace us with the narrative of it's gonna improve our productivity, it's gonna improve how we do uh, work. And I heard it firsthand from farm workers who said, the technology is going to help us take care of our bodies, take care of ourselves, and still be productive. So I wanna, I wanna leave you with that. And then the, the last thing I will say is, you know, as I said before, the rules of engagement for the next economy are being created right now in terms of legislations and rules and regulations, but everything is on the table. Let's make sure that that table is as diverse as possible and that we're anchoring everything that we do around equity in a very meaningful and intentional way. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well he, here, here's my takeaway, if I can. Um, number one, everyone should move to El Paso, Texas. That's me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you do not want to be left behind because yeah. from where I sit uh, in the entertainment industry, uh, El Paso's on the move. And, and you see this sort of genesis of this movement. Uh, number two, uh, manufacturing in the U.S. is back. And it looks like El Paso is the epicenter. So thank you to the Congresswoman. Thank you to the Assistant Secretary. Thank you to Dr. C. Uh, thank you to Pablo. Uh, you guys are, are certainly emblematic of an incredible direction uh, that's driving this country forward mm -hmm. from a manufacturing standpoint. My hat is off to you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate the panel. Also, please make sure you do not forget to tweet and retweet uh, hashtag Latinos Advance. And we want to thank you all for coming and really, really appreciate your time and energy today.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.